wish I could do this. It would be cool if I could, and that's sort of what that is. So, um, but it does have some very, it's lacking a lot of specifics, but it does have some specifics, and we'll get to those um, during the evening. The first thing I want to do is go over some ground rules. George, can you flip that, please? Oh, the other way. Okay. Um, it's really important that we don't shout each other down because it just it lets to, it just leads to a bad feeling in the room. And we don't want that. Um, it's important that it goes back and back. We don't interrupt people either. And then the other side of that point is please keep your questions short, right? Um, because if you go on too long, people feel the need to interrupt. So try to avoid. In fact, don't just try to avoid. Do avoid um, interrupting lengthy questions and shouting others down. A good good thing to think of is when I do this at a dinner table. If what I'm about to say I wouldn't say at a dinner table, don't say it here. It's the same rules. Pretty easy to follow. Okay. Um, the panelists tonight are going to be George Faulkner, Eleanor Guerrero, John Myerson, who's not here yet but is on his way, and Barb Stakes. They're not. They're going to be here, but they're not here right now because we need to get through a very brief PowerPoint presentation and then we'll move on. Okay, it's a significant time of the year for people that care about social services and specifically Medicare and Medicaid because it's Medicare and Medicaid's birthday coming up on June, July 29th. Uh, social Security is in August, Medicaid's July and it's uh, 1965, so this is the 46th anniversary of Medicaid and Medicare. And it should be a happy birthday. Birthdays are supposed to be happy. Anniversaries are supposed to be happy. The program is functioning. Um, it's, it's doing well. There's a lot to celebrate about it, except we have people who are trying to destroy it. And so we end up with a birthday that's more like this than anything that we'd actually want to celebrate. So the Ryan plan. And I called the Ryan Fitzpatrick plan. If I were in the Meehan's district, it would be called the Ryan Meehan district. Uh, Ryan Meehan plan. It's, it's, uh, Congressman Fitzpatrick voted for this. Didn't do a lot of pre-constituent outreach specifically about the impact that the bill would have on Medicaid and Medicare. Um, Social Security, food stamps. Um, I'm trying to think of some other programs that are impacted. Those are the big ones. Um, and so we're doing this to reach out to people and let them know that it does impact, so it does impact Medicare and Medicaid dramatically, and to collect questions for the congressman, because we did have asked him to do a series of town halls around the district. We've asked him to do a series of no fewer than four town halls around the district, um, explaining exactly what um, it means when you vote to end Medicare and Medicaid. And so what does it mean to end Medicare and Medicaid? How does the Ryan plan do that? It turns Medicaid into a block grant. It's kind of a modified block grant, okay? It's not technically a block grant, but what it is is a chunk of money goes to the states. 2013, there'd be a 5% cut in that money in the funding to Medicaid, 15% cut in 2015, and a 33% cut in 10 years. It's not insignificant. Mm -hmm. It had turned Medicare into a private voucher program, and the vouchers would be insufficient to meet rising medical costs. Those are facts. They simply wouldn't meet the cost, meet the, um, the costs that an average Medicare patient incurs. So, Medicare. Who cares about Medicare? In other words, who benefits? Wow, that changed. Um, so, Medicare in Pennsylvania, specifically elderly and disabled people. We have 2.2 million people in Pennsylvania who are elderly or disabled. That's about 20% of our population, 18%. Those are Medicare beneficiaries. In the 8th Congressional District, that's the one we're in, 110,000 se 110, uh, seniors and disabled people currently enroll in Medicare. That's a lot of people. It's going to impact future Medicare beneficiaries. Because current Medi Medicare beneficiaries, uh, supporters of the Ryan plan are quick to tell you, have nothing to worry about. Um, they have nothing to worry about if all they care about is themselves. They have things to worry about if they care about their adult children, if they care about their grandchildren. Um, anybody enrolling in 2022 would face out-of-pocket costs that are $6,000 higher than their costs now under traditional Medicare. In 2032, that's going to be $12,000, and that's in 2032 dollars. That's what the graph looks like, right? If, if you like to look at charts and graphs, that's what that looks like. The Ryan proposal's up top. Medicare would give you $8,000. $12,500 would be your share. Right now, your share is $6,000. That's a $6,000 difference. It's going to be bigger in 2032. 
So in the 8th district, that means there's 128,000 individuals who are going to enroll in Medicare for the first time in those between 2022 and 2032 who are going to be facing those higher costs. Now what about Medicaid? Medicaid's a little bit of a, a different uh, kettle of fish. Medicaid is, is by far larger than Medicare. It's larger than any um, government-sponsored health care program. Who benefits from Medicaid? Now I want you to take out your cards, your index cards, if you don't mind. And I want, when I put a, say the word Medicaid, I want you to write down the very first word that comes to your mind. This literally will take five seconds. You don't want to think about it too long. What's the very first word that comes to your mind when you hear the word Medicaid? Just write it down. It's okay. We're going to discuss it, but not right this second. Bill and George and Paul, would you mind collecting the cards? Whatever cards people want to collect. Want to collect? We need some more cards. Oh, you came in late. Cards for people? We have more on the there's plenty of pens on the desk. This one. Here, give me some cards. Bar pens. Oh, sorry. Raise your hand if you don't have a card, and I'll give you one. Oh. Oh. What you're asked, what you're, um, thank you. Thank you. Right. Your first reaction when you hear the word Medicaid. Thank you. Still got more coming. Question, sort of, because a lot of people don't think about Medicaid. Um, the primary beneficiary of Medicaid throughout the country is elderly people. Um, statewide and nationwide, we have about the same numbers. 65% of elderly Pennsylvanians in nursing homes are there because of Medicaid. And Eleanor is going to talk about that, how that happens. And they weren't destitute when they went into the nursing homes. In the 8th Congressional District, 58% of patients in nursing homes are Medicaid beneficiaries. That's not an insignificant number. And so the question becomes, if Medicaid ends tomorrow, or in a year, or whenever the Ryan plan would take effect, and we know that Congressman Fitzpatrick wants that to happen, what would happen to those people that are in nursing homes? Children, one in three kids in Pennsylvania is enrolled in Medicaid. Half of all births in our state are paid for by Medicaid. Um, in rural areas in the country, 75% of all births are covered by Medicaid. It's a lot of people. Who else should care about Medicaid? Hospitals, nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, um, health centers, these are all um, economic centers that get money from Medicaid. Medicaid covers 70 million people nationwide. It puts out more money than Medicare. Maintaining hospitals is especially true in Bucks County because it's our, one of our health care providers and one of our largest employers. It's true for rural areas around the country. It's going to be true for other areas in the country as the health care sector grows and it shows all signs of growing. In Pennsylvania, that 5% cut in Medicaid that the Ryan plan wants to put forth is going to lead to an estimated loss of 12,000 jobs. That's a 5% cut in Medicare, 12,000 jobs. A 33% cut, which is where they're going after 10 years, by 10 years, 80,000 jobs, almost 81,000 jobs lost. That's um, aggregate, so it isn't 80,000 on top of the 12. Okay. It's not insignificant. That's in Pennsylvania. So you might say to yourself, well, gee, I like elderly people. I hope to be one one day. It's, I, don't, I don't want to be um, destitute and on the street. Uh, disabled children and adults certainly need support. I'm not opposed to that. Pregnant women, absolutely. We want them to uh, have healthy pregnancies and have healthy children. We want their babies taken care of. In Bucks County, 700 newborns have Medicaid coverage a year. And heavens know, heaven knows we all want jobs, right? We don't want to lose those 8,000 jobs and then in 10 years be losing 81,000 jobs. But the question is, can we afford Medicaid and Medicare, right? Because you've got this deficit. And, and this is an accurate slide. This slide comes out of Paul Ryan's own uh, PowerPoint presentation. It's not an inaccurate slide. Uh, it's a little bit silly in that it goes out to 2081 when we don't know what's going to happen past 
you know, 10 years is probably um, as stable as you can get your projections to be, maybe 20. Uh, it's convention to go out 75 years on, on uh, social spending like uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. They like to be solid for 75 years. Going out to 2081 is a little nuts, but okay, they did it. And, and this isn't inaccurate. Current policy would, would do this. And the question then becomes back here, right? So can we afford Medicaid and Medicare when we have this tidal wave of debt? And this graph would say, gee, I don't know, I've got to think about that because this is the real cost, I mean, it's adjusted for inflation, per beneficiary since 1969, when it essentially began. So for the last, what, 40 years, those are the Medicaid costs. And they've done nothing but trend, well, in the 90s they dropped, but essentially they've done nothing but trend up. And that looks real bad until you ask yourself, well, if we're going to end Medicare by pushing people into private plans, that's going to have to save us money, right? But we have to if everything's going to work and we're going to reduce the deficit based on ending Medicare, except this graph tells you, no, that's not going to happen. That red line above the Medicare line that was so scary a minute ago makes the Medicare line look essentially flat. You can see that they trend together. And the problem here is, is not necessarily private insurance or Medicare. Private insurance has its own set of problems. It's 40% more expensive than, than Medicare. Um, that's because it has to build in a profit. But the problem underlying this is health care costs. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. And Medicare and private insurance um, are really the victim of skyrocketing health care costs. The difference is you can do something about it with Medicare. A little bit harder to do something about it with private insurance. Private insurance likes to follow what Medicare does because Medicare has the data available to it. It can make different changes. And private insurance likes to ride on those coattails. And George can maybe talk about that. So that's Medicare, this is Medicaid. Remember that's keeping 65% of our elderly in nursing homes. Yeah. Medicaid costs 27% less for children and 20% less for adults. So if you were gonna do anything to try to reduce the deficit and not tackle health care costs, the smartest thing to do would be to push everybody into Medicaid and Medicare. Because already you're gonna save 27% with Medicaid for children, 20% with adults, and you're going to save 40% with Medicare. So that would be the, the smartest thing to do. Nobody's suggesting doing that. But if you want, if you're serious about ending the deficit, that's probably the first thing you'd suggest. Okay. So it turns out that we can help these people, right? We can make sure that pregnant women have healthy babies. We can make sure that those babies are born in a hospital, um, taken care of from the moment they're born. We can make sure that disabled children and adults um, have some kind of support, certainly access to care. And we can make sure that we don't lose, in the next 10 years, 81,000 jobs. We can do all that. And we don't have to worry so much about the deficit, because doing this, smartly, would tame the deficit. Um, remember, this is probably going to be my last slide, because I don't want to go too long. Um, remember when I said, I don't like projecting out till 2081. It's, it's almost meaningless. If you're going to project out, project out in the near term, so things you can predict what's going to happen, you can kind of guess what's going to happen. And that takes us out to about 2019. This is from the Center um, Budget and Policy Priorities. And you can see the number one thing driving the deficit over the next 10 years is the Bush era tax cuts. If we were to stop the Bush era tax cuts, not renew them, I guess they go through 2012, if we stopped them then, and everybody said, fine, I'll, I'll go back to Clinton era tax rates, for the good of my children, so that they don't have to worry about this deficit that's going to destroy us all. That would be a sensible thing to do. The next top leading push for the deficit, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Okay? So there are things we can do that don't involve um, putting elderly people on the street, that don't involve ending Medicare and Medicaid, both successful cost drivers, drive, they drive costs down programs. We don't even have to talk about ending either program. We can talk about ending the Bush era tax cuts. We can talk about ending the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We can talk about a jobs program that would put people back to work because that big blue section at the bottom, that's the economic downturn. Okay? Every day we're, that our economy is performing below capacity, and right now we're about a trillion something below capacity, every day we do that, we're losing money that essentially goes into the, the country's bank and we're losing interest on that because that's, that's something we're never going to see again. We're, we're losing it now. 
So if we were to actually put people to work, we're talking about direct job creation. Again, no one's talking about direct job creation on either side of the aisle. Um, Penn Action is. If you're talking about direct job creation, meaning hiring people to fix the crumbling infrastructure, um, if you end the Bush era tax cuts, all of them, again, no one's talking about that, Penn Action is, and you end the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the deficit's going to be down around, well, if you just ended the Bush era tax cuts, this, this graph doesn't show it this way, but you'd be able to stabilize the debt over the next 10 years for about, at about 70% of GDP. 70% of GDP is uh, not a great place to stabilize the debt, but it's not the 100, the 400, the 800% that this scary graph talked about. Where's my scary graph? See that percent of GDP? And it goes up to over 700% of GDP? Of course that's bad. When we were fighting World War II, um, actually when it was right after fighting World War II, the deficit was uh, over 100% of GDP. So if we were to do the things I just talked about, end the Bush tax cuts, and the wars in Afghanistan and get people back to work now, then you're, you'd be able to stabilize the debt at lower than 70% of GDP. Now, does that mean it's going to be stabilized forever? No, because you've got the rising health care costs ahead, and we still need to pay for Medicaid and Medicare. But it gives you about 10 years to have a sensible, grown-up conversation about what you want to do to drive health care costs down. That's a very difficult conversation that the country has to have. It, it's going to depend on having uh, courageous and thoughtful politicians who are our leaders in policy to be able to say to you, this is what has to happen to have our costs be lower. Doctors are going to have to take less. Hospitals are going to have to take less. Or are you going to pay more? Or do you even want to drive down costs? Maybe it's okay to have one-fifth of the economy be sucked up with health care. Okay? If you're in any industry but health care, that's probably not going to sound good to you. But if you're in healthcare, maybe it will. You can see how this is going to be a, a difficult conversation to have. Every day we're not having that conversation. Every day we talk about death panels and rationing boards is another day we're wasting and, and we're losing time that we don't have. Because those medical costs are coming. And this scary graph, right, a lot of that is medical costs. And that's, that's, this is a very complicated graph, and I'm not going to make you sit through. <laughs> But it's, one, it's a favorite on both sides for different reasons. Okay, so um, I'm going to leave that graph up for a minute because it mentions the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And Bill Deckhart from Coalition for Peace Action is going to talk. Good evening. How are you tonight? Um, I hate to follow Robin because... Uh, she speaks so well, she has all the, all the facts, and she also said everything I was going to say. Um, <laughs> what? You're in front of the graph. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you can turn it off. No, it's all right. Um, so what I'm going to say, uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is, is, is kind of an emotional reaction that I have. Um, first of all, let me say I am not an apologist for Barack Obama. I am not thrilled with Barack Obama. Um, I've been out protesting much of what he's done um, as an anti-war activist. But what I noticed when he was elected, the rhetoric from the right changed to the deficit. Everything was about the deficit. That's all they talked about. Deficit, deficit, deficit. Why weren't they talking about the deficit when they were making it? Why weren't, why weren't they talking about it when George W. Bush took the largest surplus and turned it into this giant deficit. But now it's coming up. Here's the deficit. Now we want to talk about the deficit. And, and who are they blaming the deficit on? They're blaming it on you. They're blaming it on you. They're blaming it on the elderly. They're blaming it on, on what we call the greatest generation. Like my father who fought in World War II. My father who came back and, and worked like a dog for years to build a better life for his children. My father, who invested in Social Security, who paid into Medicare and Medicaid, what well, was a great ideal for people, that they had a safety net as they got older, that they could retire, that not like his father and grandfather, they had to work until the second they dropped dead. You're being blamed for this deficit, okay? And it's not your fault, <laughs> all right? It is not your fault. The money is there. And again, here they are, you know, the, the, the rhetoric of the deficit. But, it, but again, 
if, if you hear one of them talk about the, the, the putting the tax cuts back, you know, taking away the tax cuts for the richest uh, 2%, you know, I mean, you just see them quiver in fear or, you know, you talk about ending subsidies for corporations that ship jobs overseas. Oh, no, 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 can't do that. If you talk about ending the wars that are gobbling up so much money, Iraq and Afghanistan are going to cost this country three trillion dollars. When you talk about the amount of soldiers who are going to go, who are going to need Medicaid, who are going to need Medicare from, from these wars. And one war just based on lies. Absolute lies. And we're going to be paying, our children are going to be paying for it, our grandchildren are going to be paying for it. It's not your fault. And the money is there. Um, if you have the little brochure, I have just some small examples of, of what we can say. Um, on the inner page uh, by uh, withdrawing from Iraq, withdrawing from Afghanistan, eliminating wasteful weapon systems. There are wings of the United States Air Force that fly along the Alaskan coast waiting for orders to drop their nuclear payload on Russia. Isn't it time to stop? The nuclear submarines, okay? They were a great threat to the, to the, to the Soviet Union because they could in, implement a devastating first strike or if Russia had ever struck us first, they could make sure that, that they didn't get off Scotford. They, they would ensure that, that the, the Soviet Union paid. The Soviet Union has been gone for 22 years. Do, do we need it anymore? Do we need those nuclear subs? We, our Navy is so, I, I mean, are they looking for the Japanese fleet still? There are cuts that can be made. This is where the money is. And you know, and, and another thing that really bothers me too is that the Pentagon's not audited. There's no audit on the Pentagon. I mean, they're just, it, it's legendary the cost overruns. It's legendary the, the, the corruption in the, in the process of, of defense contracts. So here's just an easy way to send 200, uh, save 275 billion. Um, inside the page two, it talks about jobs created through a billion dollars of government spending. And as you can see, um, you know, tax cuts even for personal consumption, how it would create more jobs, clean energy, health care, education. You know, and actually they didn't get into um, more like labor jobs for infrastructure, but um, anybody, you know, who drove here tonight? Anyone drive here? Yeah? Anybody hit a pothole or anything like that? Oh. Yeah. Think maybe our roads need some work? Wouldn't it be nice to put some people to work? Wouldn't it be nice to get some jobs happening in this country? Okay. So, again, my reaction is I think of my parents when I talk about this. And I think of what hard-working people they were. And they deserve to have a happy retirement. All of you deserve to have a happy retirement. I deserve to have a happy retirement. And I, I hope to. So, you know, we've got to fight this. So, thank you very much. Okay, next up we have very brief five-minute presentations, just sort of introductions of four people that are going to be on the panel. And um, the point of this is so that they let you know where their area of expertise is. So that would be Eleanor, Barb, George, and John. Can you go up to them? And Eleanor can go first. Um, we'll pull us back to Medicaid. Sorry, I can introduce you, Eleanor, or I can let you introduce yourself. Eleanor is a retired social worker, um, worked around in a nursing home. She has experience dealing with people that were Medicaid beneficiaries, Medicare beneficiaries. Is there a Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, and use the, use the mic. No problem. And I'll turn this off. Is that mic on? Can you hear? No. I want to be able to show mine. Yeah, we'll have to work that out. Exercise, you know, we, we do these Rorschach things. Um, you're a very sophisticated audience because most of you came up with words like uh, poor, indigent, uh, 
women and children, someone said food stamps. There were a couple negative, very few, that it would be fraud and waste. If I had done this a while back or with an audience who really doesn't pay much attention to Medicaid, Medicare funding, I probably would have got a lot of fraud, welfare people, um, cheats, things like that. But I, I'm, I'm not going to get into any um, statistics. Robin's the expert. I just want to tell you a story about going back to um, 19, maybe it was 80, and I went to a very excellent nursing home to work. And a woman came in, she had lots of money. It was in a check account or something like a savings account. Um, her husband had died and she had saved every penny. So they were going to take her into this nice nursing home and uh, she had her all her assets and I said well can't she use Medicare and it was a revelation no nursing homes you don't use your Medicare you use your money to get into a nice home like that one and you spend it down and say she had 400,000 in 1980 I don't know what she had something like that and if you spend it down it's a roulette wheel if you live long enough um, you go on Medicaid and they cover you and the nice nursing home doesn't put you out so that was quite a revelation but I thought people were aware of that last year I met a young woman and she said my mother has to go to a nursing home so we were talking and she said well I can use her Medicare and I said no that doesn't work that way Medicare is just short term for uh, someone who needs heavy duty care but there's there's so much about the system that we don't know and I guess what I'm pointing out to you is the people on Medicaid aren't always poor haven't been poor indigent all their life they've gone into nursing homes with plenty of money and unless it's millions and millions a lot of them outlive their money fortunately they stay in the homes I guess if you go in with no money I don't know if you would get into the kind of home that these women were getting into I don't think so um, so I just wanted you to be aware of that's how Medicaid is often used in fact a large percent of Medicaid is spent on the elderly and uh, a smaller percent on women and children um, about the changes in Medicaid they're going to cut back the state has already proposed to cut back for Medicaid the nursing homes are working on a thread they're losing money they lose a lot of money on their page uh, their people they don't say patients um, their guests um, and they they make it up in other ways and I was talking to a woman from a nursing home and she said someday we won't be able to make it up in the in the less elite homes so it will mean they won't get the orange at night they won't get the picnic uh, they won't get the movie um, things like that they'll take care of them but it won't be the same so there are cuts proposed for Medicaid which will affect a lot of working people like Bill said a lot of people who worked all their lives and went in a nursing home um, so I wanted to bring that to your attention and my doing the reading um, what I came across is maybe we're attacking it the wrong way instead of cutting and slashing and ending maybe more innovation and People are always leaving the articles and someone left me something about the uh, Department of Health has a uh, panel of a lot of them are doctors and businessmen I don't know what it consists of but a lot of medical people and they are trying to find innovative ways to save money and uh, provide good service and it sounds like a really good deal I I just read the article today and uh, I hadn't read about it in any paper. It comes under the uh, Department of Health, uh, and they're meeting in Baltimore, and it's a government program. They're spending a lot of money to come up with innovations. Um, 
there's just so many other ways than hurting these people, like like the nurse said to me, they just won't get the orange juice. The, you know, they won't get the picnic. They won't get the little nice things that, that, that we can give them. So uh, thank you for the cards. I will keep them. Uh, you've come a long way from the audiences that I used to hear years ago who would say uh, welfare queens or lazy or uh, fraudulent. So thank you. Okay, Farm States is next. Farm School with, um, not with Connection, but a volunteer with Connection, an activist for healthcare for, has it been two years, Barb? A year and a half? Yeah. Um, and she can tell you her story, so I'm not going to step all over it, but I uh, just want you to know that we've been working together for a while. And I'm honored to be able to say that. <laughs> because of the pre existing condition clause in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, Barb, bring the mic closer to you. For the first time in three years, I have health insurance coverage. I just had my first year of physical GYN mammogram test and the first, first bone density test that was more than a couple years overdue. I'm finally able to receive physical therapy for a torn muscle in my shoulder after three years. The pain has pretty much always been there, it just goes from not so bad to pretty bad. I cannot sleep on that side of my body. These tests should be normal in the course of a person's life in order to remain a healthy and productive part of society. Instead, during the three years I went without health insurance coverage, I was kept up some nights worrying about the consequences of my situation. I'm over 60 and could not afford the premiums on medical health insurance plan that was offered or else I was rejected outright. Back in 93, I became seriously ill for a time. I had two hospital stays, several tests to determine exactly what the problem was, several doctor's appointments, more than a few am ambulance rides and emergency room visits, and sustaining medications ever since. If I hadn't had insurance company coverage through my job, I don't know how we would have survived that financial catastrophe. The funny thing was, I never knew that possible catastrophe existed. I never questioned what would happen if I didn't have health insurance. Indeed, I never realized that that question even existed. Only when I lost my job and the situation presented itself to me personally, did I learn the plight of so many millions who suffer indefinitely under this skewed practice of the health insurance industry? With the rich and powerful backing, the Tea Partiers and the GOP, with the assistance of Mike Fitzpatrick's vote, are doing everything they can to dismantle the PPAC on the one end that would help the younger generation and now aim to dismantle Medicare and Medicaid for the older generation. How ironic and how quickly forgotten Senator Grassley's battle cry, they're going to pull the plug on Grandma. Today, Senator Grassley wants to pull the plug on Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. How easily forgotten during the protests of the PPAC Older folks ha holding up signs that read, keep your hands off my Medicare. Now the GOP, the same ones who whispered that ignorant battle cry to Medicare recipients, the same ones that these unsuspecting Medicare recipients voted into power, are the same ones that want to take Medicare away entirely. Private insurance companies should never have been in the business of health insurance in the first place. When betting on illness, someone has to pay. And since the insurance companies must make profit, there is no question who will have to do the paying when that person becomes sick 
as to require more than put in. And since we all become sick at some time or another, the ones who will ultimately have to pay will be the consumer, not the insurance companies. The devious and greedy know how to turn a phrase that makes sense unless you peer beneath the words. They know exactly how to manipul manipulate a public that is starving. And while they manipulate us with catchphrases and double talk and keep us fighting each other over the crumbs, they are stealing the entire cake. cake. This is the time not to be dismantling Medicare. In fact, it is the time for creating Medicare for all. Thank you, Barbara. I was, uh, I started out as a health insurance underwriter back in the 1970s and then uh, became a health care consultant, worked with a large, uh, many large employers on the health care programs, uh, knew a lot about the insurance companies and exactly how they did their numbers and things like that, what was in typical policies, how they uh, saved money for themselves and made profits. So I, I have a pretty good understanding of how the system works. Um, I want to just kind of review the um, uh, Affordable Care Act very briefly because I know some people in this room probably know quite a lot about it and study it very carefully, but a lot of other people don't. And when you hear about the, the ACA, you know, your mind goes blank because you think it's so many details, so many different categories and, and topics and things like that. I tried to summarize it in a fairly succinct table here. And of course, we're going to be missing a lot of details, but I, th I think it's very helpful to sort of think of it this way. So I tried to set it up to show you know, what's the implementation timeline and who's affected. So you know, depending on your own situation, if you're already in Medicare, if you're uninsured, you work with an employer, um, you know, you're in the healthcare provider community, uh, you can kind of see what, what's going to happen or how this bill affects you over time. And of course, we're talking about a, a bill that affects one-sixth of the economy. So. <laughs> It's not surprising that something like this is going to take several years to implement. People wonder, you know, where are the changes? You know, how come health care costs are still going up? Well, the bill was just passed, you know, in March 2010. And so we're, we're not that far along. And we've got a long ways to go until we really see any serious changes. And that, that occurs in 2014, assuming that, um, you know, many of the states don't uh, renege on implementing their health exchanges and that uh, Supreme Court does not uh, overturn the, uh, uh, the, the health care bill. Anyway, um, you know, we've seen some changes back in uh, 2010, uh, mainly in September. Uh, certain things that improved coverage for many people, uh, coverage for children, uh, adult children under their parents' plans up to age 26. Six, eliminating pre-existing conditions for children and so forth. In 2011, we start to see some discounts on the, uh, uh, the prescription drug donor poll, uh, piloting of the uh, delivery system reforms. So the number of pilot projects that have been started and are being managed by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, they're starting to phase out the uh, extra subsidies for the Medicare Advantage programs. Uh, there's, of course, been a lot of um, uh, lies and, and distortions about what's going on in Medicare and that Medicare is being cut. Well, when Medicare Advantage was set up in 2003, I believe, under the Bush administration, they gave on average an extra 14, 13 to 14 percent subsidy to the insurance companies to offer <coughs> Medicare Advantage programs. So it's like taking the whole Medicare system and saying, yeah, let's raise our costs 13 to 14 percent to give them to the, give this money to the insurance companies in the hopes that you know they'll take some of this business and you know maybe they'll offer better benefits on the side, which is true. But you know when Medicare is already you know, not exactly well funded, why did they do that? And of course the Republicans approved that. There was no um, 
you know, change in the cost structure or funding of Medicare to cover that. So, of course, that increased the, the cost of Medicare. And now this plan tries to uh, reduce that subsidy and make it back to a level playing field. And people like Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman go out there saying, they're cutting Medicare, they're cutting your benefits. Well, you know, we're just putting it back on the right track. Um, so anyway, a lot of uh, kind of minor changes that will affect certain people over time. In 2014 is when the major changes come into play. That's when um, health insurance exchanges need to be set up by the states. And if the state doesn't set one up, the federal government is a fallback for the exchange. The exchange is where people who are subject to the private insurance system, they're under 65, they don't get insurance through their employer, they can go to the exchange and it's kind of like a consumer reports description of all the different health plan options on described in a, um, a common way of understanding and then comparing costs, quality measures and things like that. So they can then select their plans and then these exchanges will also administer subsidies to people based on their level of income so that they can help pay for this coverage. So the subsidies are uh, phased out as your income goes up, of course, but you will get subsidies for up to 400% of poverty level, um, depending on your situation. Uh, this is also when, of course, the mo most controversial feature takes place, and that is the requirement that everybody have health insurance. Now that requirement is actually a very mild requirement because the penalty, if you don't have health insurance, is only a couple hundred dollars a year, hardly equal to the cost of a health insurance policy. But um, that's the way it was uh, done in the state of Massachusetts, which put in their own uh, very similar health insurance system. And they did get very high compliance in terms of people enrolling in coverage. And in fact, in the state of Massachusetts now, I think it's 98 and a half percent of the population is covered for health insurance through either private plans uh, or Medicare, Medicaid, and so forth. In fact, more employers offer coverage in the state of Massachusetts, and we're also seeing an uptick in terms of employers offering coverage now under the ACA, because in part because of the um, tax credits provided to small employers uh, to help pay for, for coverage for them. So uh, a lot of good stuff in this program, but a lot of it won't show up until 2014. And people who complain that, well, healthcare costs are still going up at you know, 8, 10, 12% or more a year, that's because the cost, um, the cost control measures really haven't been put into effect yet. As I said, they're just starting to do some pilot programs in terms of uh, bundled payment uh, systems, which means that they're paying hospitals and doctors Instead of fee for service, you know, paying a doctor for every individual test and procedure, it's more of a large payment for the episode of care or just for a patient over the course of a year, what's called capitated payment. So a lot of other alternatives are being experimented with and also uh, working in some quality incentives as well. 2014, uh, there's this group which is, you know, Unfortunately, uh, very controversial, but should not be the Independent Payment Advisory Board. This is an independent board. It's not government bureaucrats. It's a lot of healthcare experts. It will even have insurance company representatives, physicians, and so forth, academic experts, who will look at studies and, and other research to show what kinds of pro, uh, healthcare treatment is effective and what is not effective. And then they're simply going to publish this information, make physicians aware of it. And you know, if you are a patient and you have some unusual form of cancer and you have other complications and so forth, then you and your doctor can talk about this because your doctor will have this research. And you can say, well, yeah, you have three alternatives, you know, a conservative one, a very aggressive one. This one will cost you a lot more out of pocket. This one, you know, maybe not so much. So it's up to you to make that decision. But wouldn't it be nice to have that research available? You think that it's already available, but it is, it is. I mean, it's just so much information overload out there. A lot of publication in academic, um, you know, uh, research uh, uh, magazines and, and publications and so forth, but it doesn't get it disseminated to the average doctor's office or, uh, or specialist's office. So, so this is a good thing to help educate people on what's effective and what's not. 
Uh, a study was done a couple of years ago, uh, I forgot who did it, uh, whether it was Harvard or whatever, but uh, that only 56 or 57 percent of uh, doctors' procedures were considered effective. The other 43 percent were considered worthless courses of treatment. Okay? So a lot of opportunity for savings there. And it's not being pushed down, it's not a government bureaucrat saying, no, we're not going to pay for this. It's more of an option. Uh, okay, can we go to the next slide? Um, can I ask you a question on that or not? Uh, yeah, end. if you have a quick question, sure. Well, let's, no, let's just hold it. Okay. Just wait right. until the end. Um, all right, and then the other kind of key thing I want to bring, bring up is just, you know, the cost of the Affordable Care Act. You, know, you still hear people saying, this is a trillion dollar program we can't afford. Well, that's totally BS. Uh, there are costs, obviously, because they're going to expand Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program. Of course, yeah, you know, we could put the poor kids on the street and not get health care, I suppose. But um, there are going to be subsidies and there are going to be costs for the health exchanges. Uh, the small employer tax credits, which are really very nominal, I think they actually probably should have been higher. Uh, and then there's areas where they're saving money. So the net result is over the 10 year period that this, the first 10 years that this program is effective, the, the Congressional Budget Office, which is a nonpartisan uh, bureau in government, it's not a Democratic thing or a Republican thing, they project it's going to save $143 billion over 10 years, the first 10 years. The second 10 years, while they say that it's not, uh, you know, as uh, clear and, and um, you know, readily certifiable, they estimate it could save anywhere from like 1.2 to 1.5 trillion dollars, and that's in the second decade. Uh, there are many other kinds of savings, like these various changes in how they pay doctors and hospital systems, so forth. They didn't even quantify what kind of savings that could produce. So it could be a greater savings than this. But you know, the Republican approach, which is repeal and replace, <coughs> first of all, would raise costs by, according to the Congressional Budget Office, I believe it was earlier this year, already would raise costs about $240 billion just because of trending. If you take away this projected savings, the costs are going to go up $240 billion by repealing the ACA. And then you have to think about, well, what are you going to put in its place? Are you going to have any kind of subsidies, or are you simply going to say, go out and find an insurance company and good luck paying that $8,000 a year? So this, while it you know, is based on projections, there's no such thing as an absolute certain projection, this is about as credible as, as anybody in the government <coughs> or health care system can get. And it's a conservative projection. So to say that we should throw this out because it's going to cost us too much money, to me, is just absolutely not true. It's going to save money. There are costs, but there are also offsetting savings. Okay? Great. I think that's Thank you. Yeah. Matt, five minutes. It's hard to keep my guys down to five minutes here. Um, John Myerson, a person who's going to tell, let us hear from the um, Southeast Pennsylvania Area Labor Fund. Federation, and remember that's important because you repeal um, Medicaid, and I mean, sorry, if you end the Medicaid, Medicare, or specifically Medicaid, eight thousand jobs, eighty thousand jobs. This is important. This is a jobs thing. We should be talking about jobs. Every time somebody opens their mouth from Washington D.C., the first sentence should be about how they've created jobs today. What do they do to create jobs? Not what they did to in the next ten years end eighty thousand in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you for giving my speech. Um, I hope that doesn't count towards my five minutes, you know. Uh, name's John Myers, and I'm the chairperson of the Southeast PA Area Labor Federation, which includes the counties of Berks, Bucks, Chester, Delaware, and Montgomery counties, basically the ring counties around Philadelphia. We represent over 100,000 working families. Um, when you look at Bucks County, which is about the 8th congressional district, well over 20, 20,000 uh, working families. Um, I'll tell you right off, I'm not a numbers guy. I'm not going to come over here right now and spend my five minutes talking to you about numbers. Uh, I'm an organizer. And as an organizer, we look at stuff and we see what's right and what's wrong. And I want to go back to the concept of the budget being a moral document. Um, 
it expresses how we feel, what we think should be done. And this Ryan budget is, is an immoral document. It's an immoral document. Clearly, it's designed. Uh, some people, and I think generously say, this budget is designed to be balanced on the back of working families. And I disagree with that. This budget is actually designed to break the backs of working families, retirees, people on fixed incomes. This budget is designed to repeal not just the ACA, but to repeal the New Deal. I mean, this is an attempt, this is a counterattack by the right. And they have never been so clear and so vicious in terms of what they want to do. And it's nationally, and it's also on a lot of state levels. You look, everybody's familiar with what's going on in, in Wisconsin. But it's also going on in, in Indiana, Missouri, Ohio, and to a certain extent here in Pennsylvania as well. Where the, you know, the budget that we just had is causing the layoffs of state workers, people who provide services to the working families of Pennsylvania. And already, Pennsylvania already has the fewest, per cap, fewest public employees per capita of every state except Florida. But this nice budget, the state budget, is going to cause layoffs. You know, they're also looking at selling public assets. Public assets. Like basically, they're looking to sell our public school system. They're looking to sell the wine and spirit shops. I don't want to get in a long debate about that. But let me just say, 5,000 jobs and $500 million a year. That's all I'm going to say about that. But this federal budget is looking to do the same thing. People are talking about it in support, you know, the, the Ryan, people who support the Ryan budget and, and, and Fitzpatrick will say, well, we have to run the government like a business. And we have to cut down to our income. Well, I'll tell you what, as a union representative, I've dealt with an awful lot of businessmen and women. And the good ones will tell you what you do is you look at your cost, and then you figure out how are you going to increase revenue. There you go, right. And how that's you what we should be talking about. Hey, how you doing? We should talk about this. Well, we could, you know, the, the, the Bush era tax cuts. God. You know, let, you know, let's get some revenue. You know, some of this very spending. God. You know, let's just raise revenue. Closing some of these tax loopholes that exist. Gone. And then we can do it. In Pennsylvania, let's tax the Marcellus Shale industry. All right? Let's close the Delaware tax loopholes that let the corporation like Walmart say, well, we're transferring our work. We have our real estate investment trust. It's headquartered in the land of not only tax-free shopping, but the land of tax-free corporations, Delaware. So they take money that was income in Pennsylvania, transfer it as a business expense into Delaware, and then they don't pay taxes on it. The money is out there, friends. The money is there, and we have to be smart. We have to say, hey, let's get the money. You do not create jobs by cutting jobs. You can see that. You know, when they told all the states, you know, all right, you got to cut your budgets. Everybody, you got to cut your budget. Cut your budgets. What happened? They cut their budgets and the job report went down. Why? The loss of public workers' jobs. Doesn't make sense. It's not going to do it. I'll turn it over to I went a little bit over Robin. But. Um, we're going to go straight to question and answer, even though I had something else planned. I think it makes more sense in this room to go straight to question and answer, so we'll do that. Um, this gentleman, I'm sorry, did you? No, the lady behind you. You had your question up. Me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, if you can clarify one, one, one thing. I'm sorry, I'm the gentleman that talked uh, about you George, the... George Walker. George. Yeah. Okay. One thing I wanted to clarify, uh, you mentioned the IPAB. Right. Um, I think there is a there is a little misunderstanding there because what was uh, what was actually discussed was the Comparative Effectiveness Research Board, not the IPAB. The IPAB is that board that's going to be um, appointed that will uh, let me see 
that will come up with ideas on how to cut Medicare. And then um, they will put that, will present that to the Congress. And then Congress has to, has to decide what they're going to do. If Congress doesn't, huh? if Congress doesn't, uh, you know, approve that, I mean, somehow it's a circuitous little process where that IPAB recommendations will go in. Right. Yeah. Will automatically go in. The comparative, the comparative effectiveness research has to do with when they, right. they, they, um, they fund research, they go through studies, and that sort of thing. One thing I want to tell you about that. They use um, a good bit of the information from the Preventive uh, Services Task Force, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. One thing I want to say about that, well, that's personal experience, personal experience was that uh, I went to my physician, and it's a group, a group practice. Uh, I went to my physician and for a regular breast exam, blah, 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 blah. Oh, well, we don't do breast exams anymore. And I said, well, what, what's the deal with that? And because of the Preventive Services Task Force. And where did that research come from? It came from Russia and China. That's directly out of this lady's mouth. And that's kind of a scary project process, you know, as far as I'm concerned. The, uh, the repeal, sure. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the correction on the, uh, the Independent Payment Advisory Board. There, yeah, there are a couple different boards or groups, and one is going to disseminate the comparative effect of this research, but they're, they're increasing the funding and they're using all sorts of sources to get that information. So I'm sure they're not just going over to Russia and China to tap that information. No, but that, um, was, that was the, the, the reference. Well, so, I mean, that's, that that's one like thing out of context, yeah. that's all I can say, is, you know, I, and I'm sure it's not representative. Um, the thing to remember about the IPAB, um, it already exists in the form of the MedPAC board, and the MedPAC board has been putting out uh, recommendations for as long as there's been the MedPAC board. You can go online and look up MedPAC recommendations. Look at them. Do yourself a favor. You'll see. It talks about increasing payments 1.1%, decreasing payments 1.1%, having doctors collect certain type of data, only Medicare, by the way. They can't talk about pro um, doctors outside Medicare. Um, having doctors uh, collect certain type of data uh, from their Medicare patients so that they can more effectively manage hospice care, all right? I mean, I, I challenge you to read through these recommendations. They are boring. They don't talk about how we can um, deny women breast exams, okay? Um, that is part, though, of the conversation the country has to have. And right now we have rationing, but it's coming from the insurance companies. The insurance companies decide what they cover and what they don't cover. So I had a plan with some company I can't remember now. I have that another plan I had before. They covered allergy shots. Either they had information that allergy, allergy shots were effective treatment or they just covered it, um, changed plans, and they didn't cover allergy shots. I didn't know why they didn't cover allergy shots. I couldn't find out why they didn't cover allergy shots. I thought I was having making progress, but as the patient, I'm not a good source of, of, of information on that, right? I'm not, what am I, I, think I, I think I'm better, I want the shots. Uh, um, the comparative effectiveness research, the IPAB, things like that, gather all this information, and then it's transparent. You can see the study that says allergy shots aren't effective. Well, and if you want them, you can have them, but you're gonna have to pay for them. And they're $40 a month, I'm sorry, they're $40 a week, and I didn't want them. I couldn't afford $40 a week, and I didn't want to adjust my life so that I could afford $40 a week. Now, so, so there's another anecdote. It isn't, you know, it's another story from a person. It doesn't really mean anything except that it's an experience, right? So, but the IPAB is going to move past that. No, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't. Individual stories, right, fine, yes. But individual stories don't mean anything statistically, and they don't mean anything policy-wise. You, what you want to do is look at long-term trends, you want to look at data, and then you want to say, okay, if I believe the allergy shots help me, I'm more than happy to go out and pay for them, or not. I can't find out, though, from my insurance company how they made that decision. Could just be they don't feel like paying for them. With the IPAB, we're going to be able to see exactly what data they're looking at, and then we'll be able to understand the it. The IPAB okay. is going to be re recommending cuts. It does not. Yeah, it will recommend things. It'll say it'll say that we're not going to pay for this because it's like here another a big thing they like to talk about is stents versus 
um, cardiac stents versus medical therapy for, for certain types of heart problems. Stents are not effective. There's, there's tons and tons of research that comes out. Stents are invasive. Stents aren't as effective as medical treatment. You know, when you treat with just drugs, medical therapy. Um, people want their stents, right? The evidence says over and over again, stents are not as effective as medical therapy. If you sit down with your doctor and he's got data or she has data in her hand, then you can feel more comfortable making the decision instead of my brother-in-law had a stent and now he's alive, or my brother-in-law didn't have a stent and now he's alive. We want this kind of data put forward. We have no choice. That monster deficit that Congressman Fitzpatrick talks about all the time, the tidal weight of death, we have no choice. We need to have this conversation. We have to have this very difficult conversation about how we're going to drive down medical costs. We have to have it. Every day we're not having it, it's a disservice to you. You had a question you were next. Okay, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. That may be on. Hi, yeah. That may be on. Hi. My name, no, I don't know whether it's yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My name's Denise Mariakis. I served the military during Vietnam. I also served the military during George Bush Sr. I was in during Operation Desert Storm, which I was against. I am a registered nurse of 25 years. I served as an Army nurse as well. I'm in the medical profession, so I understand where you're all coming from. Um, my concern is, why are we scaring the elderly with the Medicare? Why do we have to scare them? It's going to be there. It's going to be there. Okay? It will be there. They will be taken care of. The problem is our drug companies and the insurance companies. They are two of our biggest problems. And I'm tired of hearing everyone blame this party or that party. I don't care whether it was Fitzpatrick or Patrick Murphy. I don't give a shit. I'm sorry. I really don't care. But I'm tired of hearing you badmouth all the politicians. Yes. Except one did Congressman Fitzpatrick did vote to end Medicare and Medicaid. Right? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Patrick Murphy was the one that voted on a, ca a case, this law that is now in effect, against the wishes of over 70% of the U.S. population. But we're not badmouthing him. I'm sorry. I'm not badmouthing him. It was done. Okay? It was done. The point is. Why do they have to keep scaring the daylights out of people? For votes. It feels good? Oh, it feels for good. votes? I don't think for political reasons. Look, I've taken care of ill people. I've been a nurse supervisor. I'm in the, I know what's going on. I'm not a stupid person. He voted to, end to change Medicare into a voucher program. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. No, did. yeah, that's not. exactly what the Ryan plan does. No, and, he no, voted to turn, not. and he voted to turn Medicaid into a block grant. Guys, he has not scared you enough. He hasn't been honest with you. <laughs> and, and, and Obama's the one that said Obama's the one that said he's going to cut Social Security checks? Yes. yes. He's going to stop the payment? Right. But it's still, it's the scare tactics. So for the elderly people that are in here, that are in the nursing home, my mother was on Medicaid right now in the nursing home. They're not going to cut it. And Fitzpatrick's not going to cut it. Nobody's going to cut it. He did not. It's not going to be cut. Don't scare the old people. So Ryan, just to finish this no. up, Ryan I plan for this makes, his, makes its bones by saying it will cut Medicaid 5% in one year, or by 2013, 15% by 2015, I can't remember what you guys say, and 33% in 10 years. It says that. It's proud of it, guys. It's proud of it. And if Congress would... If Congressman Fitzpatrick voted for that, then he supports that. He cannot get away from that. That was a vote he took. Teresa. Uh, uh, my name is Teresa Brown Gold, and I have an art project. It's called Art as Social Inquiry. And I am observing here what I have observed in life, which makes me, uh, which made me start this project, and that is everyone is right from their own point of view. <laughs> uh, what, what the project is about is bringing that point of view to real people like Barb. Intellectually, we can take a stand and we can find all the reasons to support our ideas because we're all smart. However, if we bring this, these, this intellect to real people and real people's stories, the website is called Art as Social Inquiry. You're all invited to go and look at the portraits and read the stories. And it challenges all of us <coughs> 
to say what are the real solutions to people's problems. We're all one country. Those costs, God bless you, go ahead. If you can't, then you've got to go, because what's the point of it if you're not going to lower costs, if you're not going to ensure people out of their needs and benefits, what's the point? Thank you. Um, that Hi, my name is Rob. Okay, I'm one of those big bad Tea Party guys. And one of the things I, I've been on, I've been on the ground with the Tea Parties since their inception back in February 2009. And one of the main reasons is because we saw that the ACA, or Obamacare as we call it, was too expensive. During my travels which have included Washington, D.C., Pennsylvania, New Jersey. I've talked to many doctors. I talked to many doctors in Washington, D.C., and they told me that when Obamacare takes effect, they are getting out of the profession. This is already happening. Obama, the doctors are leaving their hospitals. They are getting out of private practice. They, no, no, it's not just because of, of the malpractice insurance. Uh, I've, I've, I've allowed you people to talk, okay? I've listened through what you've said, okay? And one of the things I'm, I would like to do, I would like to see this country come back to where we're talking to each other instead of at each other. And if we, have, we, have gotten, we have gotten to the point, yes, we are, this nation, I don't know how many of history buffs are here, but this country is more polarized now than it was in 1860. It is. And I've never, in my lifetime, I never expected to see a country that I have fought for and was willing to die for destroy itself. And that's exactly what we're doing. And until we come back and we're able to have intelligent, rational, and somewhat more gentler conversations, it's not going to work. And what you need to understand is, a lot of, I've heard a lot of what you, what you people up there have said. Here's a fact. Obamacare, the ACA, whatever you want to call it, is going to take out $500 billion for Medicare by itself. Yep, absolutely. Now, yeah. you, now let me, let me. No, no, no I, I Robin, I let you talk. Let, uh, these, these are my. Yeah, that's a question. question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I will ask the right. question. Right. I will ask the question. I don't want to hear Now, now. Well, let's, but let's that's question. Question. Yeah. 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 cost controls, reductions, cuts, whatever you want to call it, that are in the ACA, exact same ones, are also in the Ryan Fitzpatrick plan. That's right. So. Okay. In other words, okay, and your point is? Well, then you can't criticize the ACA without criticizing okay. the other thing. Let me get some. Let's let you talk. Let me talk, I, well, you talk. Let me talk for a minute. No, I am going. No, we're not right now. Ask a question. Oh, uh, no, I'm not going to ask a question. I'm going to give you what, what my thoughts are. I don't want to hear right. your statement. That's statement. okay. Sit down. Okay, okay. now. Okay. Here, no. Listen to me. You can have 60 more seconds, and then we're going to Fine, to okay. Here, here's a fact, people, okay? We cannot afford Obamacare as it stands today. Now, no, now, okay, I, I hear what you're saying, okay? And the uh, Congressman Fitzpatrick and Congressman Paul Ryan and every other Republican in, in the U.S. House of Representatives are trying to save Medicare. It cannot sustain itself in its current form. It has to be reformed. It has to be, the, the, the cost, cost effectiveness of it and the ability to pay for it has to be changed. My question is to you, okay, I've heard all of this for the last three years. I know a lot of people here are not Mike Fitzpatrick fans. Okay, that's fine. It's a free country. We're able to vote for who we want. But get your facts straight, people. Get them right. And if you're going to go after somebody, go after them with the facts. Okay, that's it. Right. Yeah. So thank you. Yellow. Hi, my name is my name is Nancy Tumor. Um, there's really only one way to reduce medical costs. All right, and that is to avoid them. Right. The only way to avoid them is to implement real preventive care. Our medical system does not have it. 
Our medical system has never had it. They don't train for it. The only community that has ever had preventive care, and you might not like this, is the alternative health care community. We have been systematically undermining that community, which is the only reason humanity is still in existence, because the medical system has only been around for what Sorry, because I don't know the answer. And it is a question. <laughs> is there a way for, an organ for organizations to opt out of this, okay. one, okay. and if, uh, the medical, uh, both a, the Obamacare, or whatever you want to call it. Two, if there is, have organizations done it? And three, if they have, why have they? What do you mean organizations? Well, it's, my understanding that, it's my understanding that hundreds of unions yes, have been exonerated from yes. the uh, Obamacare or whatever it is. Now, if that is true, is it true? Now, One. Now, most, of, most of the system is not effective in 2014. So, they're not opting out of an effort. So there's been no, there's been no relief given to unions. There, there are certain situations where some unions have what are called tax partly health and welfare. 1,400 of them? Yeah, most of them have, have tax partly why is it Wait a second, say, you said you didn't know the answer. Flavors. You said you were asking you a question yeah. and you didn't know the answer. I don't. Well then, don't tell me I'm wrong until you get it wrong. I said, why is it good for you and not for Well, me? you never let me finish, did you? Did you? No, why is it not good for me? Never mind. No, seriously. I, I did not come here like some of the other people who said they came here to have a dialogue. A dialogue means one person speaks and then another person speaks, whether you're from the right or you're from the left. I don't care. I was invited here to talk about different stuff. You know what? If I want to get into an argument, you know, there, there are people I am paid to argue with. You are not one of them, sir. You are not one of them. Thank you. Can I, can I just state my question? My question, if unions can opt out, why can I, as a citizen, not opt out? And by the way, Cat Party funds have an equal number of employer and union trustees. So it's not union. It's, in most cases, it's also an equal amount of big business when you talk about people who are opting out. And they don't completely opt out. Right. Because they have collective bargaining agreements, some of the times when they have to start logging the stuff in are changed. For example, the, uh, the, the 26 years. There was a thing that said, if you have a collective bargaining agreement and a Taft Hartley, a union employer, administered fund, jointly administered fund, you could wait until the end of the collective bargaining agreement. You can end, wait until the end before you implement it. A lot of union management health and welfare funds believed that covering kids until they were 26 or covering young adults until they were 26 was good and chose not to do that. So I mean, you know, there, there is an answer. And it, you know it might not have been the answer that you were expecting. And you know I just also you know want to say that from the point of view of labor, this is not a Republican or a Democratic thing. This is about issues. This is about strengthening and rebuilding the middle class. And I think that you know when people talk about that, that's something that probably a lot of people, if we drop the labels. If we drop the labels, we can get along. And, and while well, I have the floor, uh, for the lady there and the gentleman who I believe left, who identified them, sir, who identified yourselves as veterans, thank you. Yes, that's First of all, if we're supposed to be having a civil discussion, we why is it every presentation talked about the other side and they? Yes. I found that yes. extremely. Yes. 
annoying. That's number one was my question. My second question is, how can anyone possibly believe that Obamacare can cover 30 million more people and save the country money? The only way the CBO could score it was number one, which they admitted to, that Medicare was cut all that money and they put it in two pots, one to save Medicare and one to fund Obamacare, which when they were asked, they said, yes, it cannot be in two places. It is only one pot of money. So that's one falsity. The other falsity is they conveniently left out every administrative cost, including all the IRS agents that yes. they had to hire to administer it, okay? All the bureaucratic agencies, I forget how many there are, and as the people who know what they're talking about said, garbage in, garbage out. But if you understand that they are going to cut how much they give to the doctors, and of course the doctor fix will be in a different pot, of course, we, if we put that in, it would have shown how much money Obamacare was going to cost. So therefore, all these doctors will leave, you'll put all these other people on the rolls, and when you call up, you will be waiting, just like they do in England for an appointment, right. to see a nurse practitioner. Yeah, so again, how can you say the one on right? We'll go back yeah. They've done something very similar to this in Massachusetts. They don't have people waiting like they do in oh, yes, they oh, oh, yes, they oh, yes, they do. Oh, yes, they do. 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 Are happy with what they have. No, 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 no. Okay, no, they're not. I'm telling you, Massachusetts has a class in a fiery ruin of people dying. I read this. They stuff. have people covered. Now they're tackling the costs. Um, ACA are trying to tackle coverage and costs at the same time. The first question was if you're having a civil conversation. Yeah, and why is it possible to have a civil conversation and still to want to hold the congressman accountable for taking one of the most radical votes in American history? We've had these programs in place for 46 years. But you didn't with just one address vote, him. With you one said vote. everybody. Because we need right. to hold Congressman Fitzpatrick accountable. He has to be held accountable for this vote. We didn't even get to the Medicaid, the, the med, all the med, implications of Medicaid. Here's one question. When it's a block grant, that's what the congressman voted for, so that's one plus one. When it's some type of modified block grant, and that money runs out, who's going to take care of, for instance, me when I'm in a nursing home, if I get to live that long? Is there going to be in all the paperwork that my children have to sign to admit me? Is there going to be a line that says, and if when Medicare runs out, which it's going to do sooner because they're going to cut it 33% in 10 years, when Medicaid runs out, um, um, you're responsible for your mother's care, because currently that's not how it goes. So are my children, excuse me, that's the question I want to ask the congressman. That's one of a lot of questions I want to ask the congressman, that he's not having town halls like this dedicated to medical stuff, dedicated yeah, to health policy. Yeah. 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 Not yeah. dedicated. Yeah. 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 He has yeah. never yeah. stood yeah. with yeah. the yeah. group like this and explained. He has never sat in front of a group like this and explained to me, or anybody else who may end up in the nursing home, in the near future, how are you going to pay for it when the Medicaid is gone? That's what we need him to answer. Is it going to be my kids? Or do my kids need to take me home? I don't know how many people in the room understand what it takes to take care of someone. Because you're saying he wants to end Medicare on the one hand, but what he's trying to do is to save it because in its present form, it cannot exist. Okay, but everybody remembers the graph I showed, right? The graph that came from the CBO, it came from the CBO, and the CBO again shows that private... The CBO doesn't produce garbage, I'm sorry. No, no, no. 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 Hey! Oh, shit! Yeah. People, calm down. You know what? Yeah. Hold on. No, fuck you. Yeah. You can say that the shower is something yeah. else. Guys, I think we need to go. Who's that? Who's that? Wait, we have a question over here. Wait, close. You actually spoke, sir. Sir, you spoke. We like to see one another. Then get your facts right, people. We have to get your facts right. Because they don't like us here. We're almost at our time, so. Yeah, so, 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 yeah, so I just like to give you a, a small uh, thing. One, at the end of the day, we're all going to look at this, our bills. 
this is my mother-in-law's bills from when she died. My mother-in-law had Medicare and the federal employee Blue Cross Blue Shield. Tough crowd, Robin. With this big stack of bills, they're all zeros. Nothing. We pay very little out of pocket. We had maybe a couple thousand dollars um, that wasn't covered by the nursing home. And um, we paid for a private aid, so that was several thousand more dollars because we felt we wanted to give her the absolute positive best care. So that's my mother-in-law. My husband and I, we carry one of the best policies that you can buy on the private market. We have a 90% coverage in sales. And I think if we start to break into smaller groups and start saying, okay, what is the devil in the details? Some of the details in the ACA are going to be correct, and they decided correctly. There are some things, because it's such a huge change, that when you get the devil in the details on the Ryan care, you may, and I support Obama, there may probably be something where I start going through each and every detail, that, hey, you know, this point, man's got a point. So what I think would be more productive would be if we start to break into some groups and go point by point by point and start saying, this works, this is an issue, and move away from labels, move away from politics and start saying, this point, yes, we all want it, that point, no, we all definitely don't want it. So let's end on that and then end on that and we'll do this. I just had one. Really wait, 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 wait. Because what's your name? I know you. Carol. Carol makes an excellent point. And what we need to do then, you seem to suggest, is to have calmer, listening type of things. But Tim Sinclair's in the audience. I know she led these, these kind of listening tours. You go around the state and county or whatever. And you listen to what people say. That's going to have to come from leadership. And, um, well, it's going to have to come from our political leaders, or it could come from our political leaders working in conjunction with our health policy people. But it has to happen. You see how high the tensions are. I mean, a lot of that is politics. I'll be the first one to admit that. A lot of that is politics. But more of it is we're all very frightened about what's going to happen to our health care because we've all had experience with the health care system. And as Carol said, it's broken. And we're frightened about what's going to happen. And it should frighten you. And this is setting politics aside. If, any, if anybody had done this, I would have been out here doing this. It should frighten you that Medicaid is on the, the block, that it's, been fr that it's been voted for, that Medicaid's going to be turned into a block grant. I'm afraid that I haven't done my job. You don't understand. Eleanor, we didn't make the point clear enough. If Medicaid is gone, you guys aren't going to have care. Well, the older of you will, but for instance, people like me, I don't know. Point is, I don't know. We're not getting answers. We're running out of money because I'm 46 years old. So if you're in my cohort, then you're going to have the same type of experience going forward. Are my children going to have to pay for my care and nursing home? I want that answered. It doesn't isn't answered in the, in the Ryan bill. I want it answered. It was voted on without anybody's input. It was voted on without answer, without that question being asked. Or any like answer being so are our legislators like going to take uh, the same care that we do? That means we should be doing it. And if they're going to force this on us, then they should also have the policy. If anybody wants to sign a letter to Congressman Fitzpatrick, I have them up here. I also have these. Oh, I have the letter ready. Okay. But, um,